Sun-scorched sand swallows nearly 70% of Turkmenistan, a country where the Karakum Desert stretches an astonishing 350,000 square kilometers, yet Ashgabat's leaders claim they can weave a living oasis across this barren expanse by pumping farm runoff into a man-made inland sea and surrounding it with forests dense enough to blunt dust storms. But could an artificial lake larger than Luxembourg truly hold 130 cubic kilometers of water? Will 30 million tree seedlings really survive in soil that bakes at 50 degrees Celsius each summer? And what happens if the pumps ever fall silent? You are about to uncover Turkmenistan's audacious blueprint to turn its desert into a green paradise and the razor-thin margin between miracle and mirage. And behind it all lies a question few dare to ask. Can a country with some of the world's most lowest transparency scores really pull off one of the boldest ecological engineering feats of the century? To grasp Turkmenistan's new gamble, you first need to relive its last great engineering leap. In 1954, Soviet crews broke ground on the Karakum Canal, carving a waterway that would eventually snake 1,375 kilometers from the Amu Darya River across the sands towards the Caspian. By the time the work officially wrapped in 1988, the canal was gulping 13 cubic kilometers of river water every year, irrigating cotton fields that glittered like mirages against the dun-colored dunes. Today, the canal remains Turkmenistan's most critical irrigation artery, still delivering over half of the country's diverted freshwater supply. The project was hailed as proof that mankind could command the desert. The canal transformed daily life. Small orchards replaced goat chewed scrub. Most importantly, the canal's concrete ribbon stitched an agricultural spine through the nation, ensuring food security and political leverage in a region where every litre of freshwater is contested. That spine, however, was never meant to be the final triumph. Generations raised watching barges glide through dunes began to wonder what else might be possible. Out of that collective memory, half pride, half unfinished business, rose the conviction that the desert itself could be subdued, not just crossed, setting the stage for an even bolder undertaking. Enter the Altin Asa, or Golden Age Lake, a massive bowl excavated in the Karashor Depression roughly 264 kilometers north of Ashgabat. When filled, this reservoir is designed to blanket 2,000 square kilometers with sapphire water and plunging 70 meters at its deepest point, holding more than 130 cubic kilometers of drainage runoff, making it one of the largest artificial reservoirs on Earth by volume, if it ever fills. Feeding that basin is a circulatory system of collectors and canals stretching 2,650 kilometers, an arterial network longer than the Nile. The price tag, first floated at 4.5 billion US dollars, already overshadows the country's annual health budget, and critics argue that the eventual bill could soar past 6 billion if pumped energy costs are factored in. For comparison, Turkmenistan spends less than 300 million dollars annually on public education. The lake, critics argue, diverts funds from services citizens actually use. Even so, successive presidents have portrayed the lake as destiny. Supporters say it will capture pesticide-laced runoff that currently seeps into border rivers, letting sediment settle before the cleaner top layer evaporates or seeps into the water table. Yet the timetable keeps sliding. Ground broke in 2000, officials forecast completion by 2025, and now engineers speak of another decade of dredging. Each delay feeds skepticism, but each freshly poured segment of canal also reminds locals how the impossible can inch towards reality. Water alone cannot conjure a paradise, roots must follow. In 2021, Turkmenistan's National Forestry Program reported planting 30 million deciduous, coniferous, and fruit seedlings across the provinces, roughly one sapling for every resident of Scandinavia. A decree signed in February 2024 offered another 3 million seedlings, specifying drip irrigation to stretch every drop in a land where annual rainfall averages a scant 150 millimeters. That's drier than parts of the Sahara, which raises questions about how even drought-resistant saplings can thrive long-term without significant water support. In 2023, nearly half a million saplings were planted in a single day, a media spectacle whose true impact remains uncertain. The flagship is the Ashgabat Green Belt, a 30-kilometer-wide ring of saxel, elm, and salt-tolerant shrubs encircling the capital. Researchers tracking dust sensors on the city's outskirts reports a 10% decline in particulate peaks since the first belt segment matured, 
though peer-reviewed data remain scarce. Farmers on the downwind side of the belt say apricot blooms now survive spring gales that once sandblasted petals before fruit could set. Beyond the capital, highway medians sprout rows of young pine and pistachio intended to anchor dunes that wander onto roads each windy season. Survival rates vary widely. Field surveys by independent ecologists in 2024 found that fewer than half the seedlings in the driest districts made it through their first summer without supplemental watering. Yet foresters counter that Saxel's deep tap roots can take three years to tap subsurface moisture. Success, they insist, should be judged a generation from now, not a season. For a government eager to showcase progress, patience is a harder sell than statistics, but every living sapling hints at the payoff if the long game prevails. Behind the soaring rhetoric lies an unforgiving arithmetic of pumps, pipes, and evaporation. Moving runoff uphill towards the lake demands an estimated 350 megawatts of continuous power, enough to light a mid-sized European city. Engineers therefore divided the collector system into segments that rely on gravity where possible, punctuated by pump stations that lift water in 8 to 10 meter increments to minimize energy spikes. The approach reduces power draw but extends transit times, meaning pesticide-laden water can stagnate for weeks, intensifying chemical loads before reaching the basin. Hydrologists worry that evaporation will concentrate salts faster than inflow can dilute them, transforming the reservoir into a brine pan poisonous to fish and crops. A 2024 investigation report by Progress Online warned that salinity levels could breach 8 grams per litre within 15 years if current runoff chemistry holds far above thresholds tolerated by most freshwater species. Government scientists rebut that naturally alkaline Karashore clays bind sodium, a claim yet to be independently verified. Meanwhile, downstream nations eye every cubic meter entering the collector network, fearing reduced Amudarya flows as climate change shrinks glaciers in Tajikistan's Pamirs. Uzbekistan, in particular, has raised concerns in closed-door regional forums worried that Turkmen diversions could aggravate water shortages already threatening its own cotton harvests. Then there is the Aral Sea ghost. Environmentalists recall how Soviet cotton schemes siphoned that inland sea towards oblivion, leaving toxic dust bowls that still scour communities. Turkmen officials insist the new project uses only drainage water that cotton fields would discharge, regardless. But satellite images show diversions occasionally tapping the main river during drought years. The pumps may roar on schedule today, but if electricity falters or regional politics shift, a half-filled lake could stagnate into a giant salt flat, broadcasting failure across the steppe. Keeping those pumps humming has pushed Turkmenistan to flirt with renewable energy after decades of natural gas dependence. In 2024, construction finished on the nation's first grid-tied hybrid solar wind farm, a 10-megawatt array in Balkan province designed as a testbed for scaling up clean power to support desert greening. The hybrid system balances daytime solar peaks with night winds, offsetting pump loads and showcasing 24-hour clean power potential. The site already logs capacity factors above 28%, respectable for Central Asian conditions, and planners say a full gigawatt of renewables could be installed around the lake by 2035 if financing materializes. Renewables tackle more than kilowatt hours by wiring collector stations to local solar microgrids. Planners aim to cut transmission losses that bite hard in high heat environments. Modular battery banks buffer output, allowing pumps to maintain steady flow rates that prevent canal banks from cracking under pulsed pressure. Those batteries also power LED grow lights in nurseries that rear drought resistant seedlings, destined for the green belt, closing a virtuous loop between electrons and leaves. Abroad, investors measure risk in transparency as much as turbines. Turkmenistan's opaque data culture deters many lenders, yet the eco-village project beside Altun Asir is spearheaded by a Turkish firm accustomed to regional dynamics, signaling that at least some capital is willing to bet on the vision. Should the hybrid model prove bankable, similar clusters could dot the desert, each coupling renewable plants with drip-irrigated orchards that turn wastelands into export-oriented agri-parks. For now, the pilot doesn't shout success, it murmurs feasibility, but every watt it produces chips at the fossil fuel bill and nudges the grand design another inch towards fiscal sense, underscoring how the green dream must be powered by green electrons if it is to endure. Stand on a dune at sunset and you can already glimpse the outline of Turkmenistan's gamble. 
a dark ribbon of water glimmering in a basin that was once dry lifetimes ago, clusters of saplings casting spindly shadows, and on the horizon, turbine blades slicing in the crimson sky. Yet beneath the photo ops, survival depends on roots, not rhetoric, and on how many saplings still stand when the mercury hits 50 degrees Celsius. The stakes extend beyond national pride. If Alton Asif fills on schedule and the green belt takes hold, Turkmenistan could buffer itself against dust storms that now roll across borders that wealthier Gulf states are watching closely. Failure would ripple just as far, reinforcing narratives of megaproject hubris and sparking new quarrels over every diverted drop. In a region where water politics already pits upstream hydropower against downstream agriculture, the desert may become a courtroom and the wind its stenographer. So is the plan insane or inspired? The honest answer is that it remains both. Suspended between spreadsheets and shifting sands, the Canal era taught Turkmenistan that colossal infrastructure can redraw geography and that every redirected river casts a long ecological shadow. The years ahead will reveal whether the Golden Age Lake and its forecasted halo grow in a living sign of human ingenuity or fade into the catalogue of vanished ambitions. What's your take on Turkmenistan's plan to green the desert? Is it visionary or just a massive gamble? Drop your thoughts in the comments and make sure to like and subscribe for more mind-blowing stories.